Okay, so um, we're here tonight uh, uh, to um, discuss um, Jeff Garton's book, Three Days at Camp David, How Our Secret Meeting in 1971 Transformed the Global Economy. I'm Ken Jacobs, and I am uh, Chairman and CEO of uh, Lazard. Uh, and I have the honor tonight of, um, of getting to uh, interview Jeff, uh, who is author, author of this new book. Jeff is the Dean Emeritus at the Yale School of Management. He served in the Nixon, Ford, Carter, and Clinton administrations and was managing director of Lehman Brothers in the 1980s and the Blackstone Group in the 1990s. He has written widely in major publications and is the author of five previous books on the global economy. Of course, uh, and uh, I should say that um, uh, I have a long history with Jeffrey, and uh, but for Jeffrey, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today, either interviewing him or as CEO of Lazard. Uh, I got to meet Jeffrey when I graduated from college and moved to New York. Uh, at the time, he was the first investment banker I ever ever met or experienced, and what he was doing was exciting and transforming uh, to me at that point, and uh, introduced me to this this incredible world that I've gotten to live in over the past thirty or forty years. Um, with that as introduction, uh, maybe I can turn to Jeffrey and um, uh, Jeff, perhaps you can um, quickly summarize for the audience uh, the book. Okay, uh, thanks, Ken. Um, the story of this book really begins in 1944. Um, that was the time of the Bretton Woods Conference uh, occurred just as the Second World War was ending. Um, and the Allies got together and they created a new kind of world economy. Um, at the heart of this was the dollar. Um, and in order to make the dollar really strong and really acceptable to everyone around the world, they fixed the dollar to gold at a fixed rate. So $35 bought one ounce of gold. And they basically said to the world, if you are outside the US and if you hold dollars, you can always convert those dollars to gold. And that was a solemn commitment. And that link created a level of stability in the global economy that led to all through the 50s and the 60s, a massive increase in international trade, a massive increase in international investment, um, incredible recovery in Western Europe and Japan, and the kind of prosperity that existed in the US that we only dream about now, which is really a middle-class prosperity. Um, in August of 1971, 50 years ago this coming August, uh, the Nixon administration decided that they had to de-link the dollar from gold. And that's the event I wrote about, and it seems startling in retrospect why they did that, because the dollar-gold relationship was so key. Uh, and my book really is about the meeting at which they decided that they could no longer back the dollar was gold. In short, people wanted the dollar. The dollar was used all over the world. We were beginning to run trade deficits, which meant that a lot of dollars were going abroad. Our military expenses abroad were escalating. And there were so many dollars abroad that they vastly exceeded the gold we had. And so we could no longer credibly um, make the commitment to exchange gold for dollars. Now this sounds a bit technical, but in fact, my book is about the broader significance of this decision, because this really was the fault line of American politics and economics uh, since the Second World War. Um, the US was basically saying, we can't hold up the world the way we did after the Second World War. We can't shoulder all these responsibilities. And by delinking the dollar to go, uh, the, the gold dollar link, um, the US was really saying, it's not just going to be the US, but it's gonna to have to be 
Western Europe, and it's going to have to be Japan uh, um, who will shoulder the burdens, not only of the world economy, but of global security. So uh, it was an inflection point, and uh, um, it, the gold dollar relationship is a really very interesting point, uh, a, a good focus to see this big change. So this is a character-driven book, and um, uh, and there's some really uh, unique characters and very uh, famous subjects in this book, and we get to see them. I mean, I think of many of these characters as old, as an example. I mean, I, I you know, you think of George Schultz um, <clears throat> and Henry Kissinger and um, uh, uh, Pete Peterson, uh, and I think of them as late in their careers, and each of them were very much in the formative part of their careers making this policy. Um, you know, can you speak a little bit about the characters and your experience with them? Because I think one of the things that's unique about this book is you've know, you knew all these individuals um, personally, and you had a chance to interview them. Uh, and you also knew them around the time that they were uh, uh, developing this policy. And each of them was at a relatively early part of their career. So maybe you can spend a few minutes talking about that, Jeffrey. Yeah, um, you know, I, I wanted to write the story of a meeting, the meeting in which the decision to sever the relationship uh, to a dollar and gold uh, was taken. Uh, and I wanted to bring the reader right into the room. And the only way I could think of to do that is to really develop the characters who were around President Nixon. Um, as you said, Ken, a lot of these uh, people were um, much better known uh, as their careers developed. At this particular time, they were all in their, uh, really in their early 40s. Um, and so Nixon took several people with him. Some, some names will be recognizable, but um, one of the key ones probably people today may not remember is uh, John Connolly, who was the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, he had been the governor of Texas for three terms. He really had been an assistant to Lyndon Johnson for many years and was uh, a strident nationalist. He would have been very much at home in the, uh, in the Trump administration. And he was really leading the charge to delink the dollar from gold. And Nixon used him as kind of a battering ram against a bunch of other officials who were a little more hesitant about this, even if, even if they wanted to do it they were worried about the ramifications. Um, then there was a young fellow who nobody ever heard of named Paul Volcker, who was uh, undersecretary of the treasury, a real technical person at the time. Um, he was very different from Connolly because he basically, he was the only one at this meeting who really understood the intricacies of the global financial system. And, uh, he wanted to, he, 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 like everybody there, he thought the dollar was overvalued. And so he wanted the dollar to be devalued, but he wanted to maintain fixed relationships uh, because he thought that was the kind of stability that governments should really strive for. Um, then there was Arthur Burns, who was uh, head of the, uh, of the Federal Reserve. And Burns has gone down in history as someone who, uh, a led inflation out of the bag. But basically in this meeting, um, he, he was worried about inflation um, and he did something which was rather strange. He, he didn't think that fiscal and monetary policy could tame inflation, but he wanted a wage price freeze, which he, he persuaded Nixon to do. Um, George Schultz was in the room. He was the head of the Office of Management and Budget. Um, no one had ever heard of him. He had come, he was a labor negotiator basically and former Dean of the, of the business school at the University of Chicago. And of course, like Volcker, Schultz went on to be uh, a great statesman. And there was Pete Peterson, as, as Ken said. Peterson had been, is, was the only one uh, from industry in the room. Uh, he had been the president of Bell and Howell 
uh, at a very young age, and he was only in his early 40s here. Um, and he had this illustrious career ahead of him, but outside of industry, nobody had heard of Peterson either. And Henry Kissinger wasn't at the meeting because he was uh, busy uh, in a, another secret meeting uh, trying to negotiate the end of the Vietnam War, but he did become quite uh, involved as soon as the decision was made because the decision had enormous uh, foreign policy ramifications. And one of the things I tried to show was that each of the people in this room brought something very different to the party. They had quite differing views. Uh, they brought different experiences. And there was also a very great tension between the economic issue of severing the dollar gold link and the foreign policy issue, which was really, um, the allies were very upset by this and the need to keep them in the fold uh, was, was really acute. So you had Kissinger on the foreign policy side and Connolly, the economic nationalist on the economic side. And I tried to show how this tension, uh, how it was dealt with and, and how Nixon basically worked with both men. Well, it was fascinating. I mean, just on this last point that, that you made, you had uh, three, strain, three strains of thinking which were present in 1971 and yet also present today. You had the populist, almost populist nationalist uh, sentiment of Connolly and to a degree Nixon. Uh, you had Schultz, the, the, uh, the strong free market, and you had Volcker, more the traditional, I wouldn't quite call it Keynesian, but um, more traditional economics. And it was kind of fascinating to see the three, the three policy uh, polls uh, kind of competing and butting heads with each other as to what the right outcome would be. Right. Well, you know, the thing is that, that what made this meeting, I think, very special was that there was an opportunity really to express all the different views. And that Nixon, Nixon was, you know, we think about Nixon and Watergate, but actually, before Watergate, I think uh, Nixon was quite an effective uh, president. And he, in this, in, in this big meeting, which I assert is the most important economic decision that had been made in that relating to the international monetary system since uh, 1944, and I would say even up to today, um, this was a real, real big decision with enormous ramifications. And I think Nixon was really up to the task of uh, balancing all the views. Let's talk about that for a moment. Um, you've made the point that you think this is the most important economic decision. Uh, let's talk about a few reasons why. Why at the time was it so important? Uh, what was the ramifications for the 70s and what do you think it's meant long-term? Well, I, one reason it was really important is that, um, you know, for over two decades, the entire global financial system revolved around the dollar gold link. And it was, a real, as I said before, a really successful system. Um, and uh, the United States in basically saying, this system is no more, um, was, was um, really declaring that we needed a different kind of system. Um, and, uh, you know, when you take something that is successful, particularly in the economic and financial realm, and you change it, you really don't have uh, great uh, visibility into what all the effects are going to be. So it was a very, it was a big decision. It was a very gutsy decision. And the U.S. had to make it, they had to do it because we couldn't convert dollars to gold anymore. We simply didn't have enough gold. In fact, we had 25% of the gold that we needed, which was a long descent from what it used to be where we had 160% of the gold uh, that we needed. So, you know, we, we, had to, we had to make this decision. And the reason it, it, it was such a big economic one is it, it removed the stability of exchange rate, of fixed exchange rates. Um, and it basically allowed the market to take over and, and eventually exchange rates began to 
fluctuate against one another. Um, so that, so that, that on the economic side, and I'll come back to that, on the political side, we were, we, the decision wasn't just about the dollar and gold. At that meeting that I write about, it was also determined that the Europeans and the Japanese um, could no longer have preferential access to our markets, that they had to open up their markets in the same way we opened up ours to theirs. Because up until then, we were helping them to recover. But by 1971, we were running trade deficits. And we basically said to them, the, uh, the, recovery, the recovery phase is over, phase is over. You now um, have to carry your own weight. And by the way, we said, you're also going to have to pay more for your defense. So from a political standpoint, this was uh, the US saying, we are ending one era and, and starting another. But to go back to the exchange rates, you know, when, when there was fixed exchange rates, there was very little risk in the global financial system. Um, we didn't have international banking crisis, for example. Um, everybody knew what the exchange rates would be, but once they were free, that created a certain degree of risk and the risk got bigger and bigger. And so financial markets began to develop um, instruments that could uh, deal with the risk that was occurring in the financial system. So in my view, delinking the dollar from gold and going from fixed to floating exchange rates was the beginning of a massive um, sort of an era of financial engineering, an era of financialization where um, there was, you know, it was uh, the industry of money making money on money as opposed to direct investment in, in, in the productive economy. This is when it really began and it got bigger as everybody knows, it got bigger and bigger until the financial sector in the US became so gigantic and became very casino-like. So um, the guys sitting around the, at Camp David making the decision uh, that weekend had no idea of what they were going to unleash. I, and, and I don't say that as a criticism. I don't think anybody could have known. But the financial ramifications, as well as the pol political ramifications, were, were really massive. And Let's come back to it a little later. Yeah. If we go back to the, the events of that, that, that famous weekend, how much do you think they were uh, aware that this was inevitably going to lead to floating, ex floating exchange rates, number one. And number two, how much do you think they were aware that by going to floating exchange rates, it would take significant pressure off of governments when it came to actually uh, implementing policy measures, responsible policy measures around management of the economy to keep exchange rates stable? Well, um, originally in that room at Camp David, uh, there was one person who really favored going right to floating exchange rates and that was George Schultz. Schultz had come from the University of Chicago and although he was not uh, um, extremely knowledgeable about the international economy, he was a very free market guy. And so he just didn't think it made sense um, to have fixed exchange rates. He thought exchange rates were like any, anything else, should move up and down with supply and demand. But as an in administration, they were not thinking about going directly to floating exchange rates. They wanted to see a little more flexibility so that exchange rates might be able to fluctuate, say 2% up or down. Um, and they wanted a cheaper dollar because the dollar was fixed to gold in 1944, and it was a time when the US was super, super strong. But by 1971, the dollar was overvalued and it was hurting us in the, in the trade arena. So they, what they really wanted was just to change, to realign exchange rates and then fix them again. But it never, it never took, they, made, they, they got an agreement to do that, but very shortly afterwards, uh, oil prices started, the, the, the OPEC embargo came along, oil prices quadrupled, 
And this sent such shockwaves through the global economy and affected different countries in different ways that basically fixed exchange rates, no matter what the realignment was, um, just couldn't hold. Yeah, I must say, in, in, in looking back on that, and it's easy to say this today with, high, with perfect hindsight, but it seems somewhat naive to think that if you went off fixed exchange rates, you could forever fix them again with 15 or 20 countries having to agree with it and all the uncertainties of the world around it um, without any kind of, and, and, and also you have, um, once you've done this, you've sort of unleashed it so it can always happen again. Uh, so that seemed, it seemed to me that the minute that they, started down this path that inevitably was going to go floating uh, and such. Um, you know, you're, you're right. Back, yeah. Yeah. I mean, sorry, looking back, you, you're right. Looking yeah. back, it does seem a kind of naive. But from their st standpoint then, this was the only world they knew. Right. And it was a very prosperous world. Um, and I think it was very hard for them to uh, admit to themselves that they were embarked on a set of changes that would really get out of their control. Yeah, um, and how uh, not, how how aware do you think they were of the uh, change in uh, pressure to or, or the ability to use or need to use the tools of um, monetary policy and fiscal policy? to keep exchange rates constant? Or do you think they understood that it started, they, as soon as they started to float, it gave them much more flexibility to ignore those uh, issues and just let exchange rates go where they're gonna go? Well, from the United, United States standpoint, we were much, and, and, and remain the same way, we are much less dependent on the rest of the world than they are on us. And so the notion that we would use our fiscal and monetary policy to stabilize exchange rates really was something that it was not going to happen. It, it just uh, no administration would do that and certainly no Congress would do that. So the notion of having very flexible exchange rates and letting the exchange rate basically move up and down as opposed to changing fiscal and monetary policy um, was something very attractive to the US. But, um, you know, we, we were dealing um, with West Germany and Japan and from their standpoint, this was not, this was not at all ideal. They were much more dependent on trade as was France and as was England. And so we didn't, we didn't want to shove down a system, a shove a system down their throats that they would find uh, extremely onerous because Remember, this was the early 70s. We're in the middle of the Cold War. Um, we needed those allies that Nixon wanted to make sure that those allies were, were solidly in our camp. Um, and, uh, and so these economic issues had to be seen through a political lens as well. And I try to show all this by actually, you know, I, I, I had as transcripts, I had diaries. And I tried to recreate in the three days in which this decision was being hashed out at Camp David, uh, almost hour by hour, what, what these guys thought, and, and they were all guys at the time, what, what yeah. they thought and, and uh, you know, how they expressed themselves and how they came to the conclusion that they did. Uh, can you speak, Jeffrey, a little bit about the public reaction to this in the United States of the announcement? Um, and also, I think linked to that was the fact that there was, yes, the dollar and gold convertibility, which was quite complex, wage and price controls, which was very easy to understand, import restrictions, again, very easy to understand, and how that mix was, was received by the public, because that was kind of fascinating to me. Yeah, well, let me go back. It's, I've been, we've been talking about the dollar-gold relationship, which was the, kind of the the big international decision that was made. But uh, Nixon and his advisors actually that weekend formulated a very um, broad package of policies. And the idea was to make a really big splash and to say, uh, the world is changing, we're changing with it and we're leading. And in order to do that, he needed to have some domestic initiatives as well as international ones. 
So um, the big decision was the dollar severed from gold. Um, he didn't know how other countries were going to react. And, and what he wanted was to renegotiate the exchange rates so that the dollar was uh, much lower in value. And he was afraid the other countries wouldn't do that. So part of the package became a, a tariff that we put on all imports, which would last until other countries agreed in a negotiation to a, a devalued dollar. Um, now with a devalued dollar, uh, you would imports would be much more expensive. And so that would be very inflationary. So in order to contain the inflation pressures, they did something extremely radical, as radical as decoupling the dollar from gold. And they declared a freeze on all wage and prices for 90 days. The idea being there couldn't be any inflation because um, by government uh, edict, no prices or wages could increase. Um, and uh, that was a demonstration to our own people that we were very serious about containing inflation. And it was a, it was a statement to the rest of the world that don't worry about inflated dollars because we're holding inflation down at home. Um, so all of, these, all of these measures came together. And from a domestic political standpoint, it was an enormous success. Uh, it was the stock market um, increased uh, at an order of magnitude that was the greatest since the Second World War. Uh, and everybody, there was something for everybody in this package. And so domestically, it was very popular. Um, and that was one thing that made Nixon very happy because he was coming up for re-election in two years. Um, internationally, there was, uh, I think, extreme anxiety. What was going to happen to the global economy with when the dollar wasn't linked to gold? What happened to all the dollars that other countries were holding, thinking they were worth a certain amount of gold? How could the US impose a tariff on all imports when, the, when, when America was saying, we stand for free trade? And so there was a very sharp difference between how the package was uh, received in the US and how it was received uh, by other countries. And all of this had to be settled in subsequent negotiations. And here's where Kissinger was very, very important because although he, he himself would never say he understood these economic issues very well, he was able to um, translate exactly how other countries felt to Nixon and to Connolly and to help the US meet them halfway. But there was sort of a uh, series of agreements. Uh, there was a first agreement which uh, took place, I guess, uh, the following autumn or December, uh, where basically the uh, package that had been, th that had been proposed or, or presented in August was largely agreed. Uh, and in that, it, it ended up having the import tariffs come off and um, uh, the devaluation of the dollar of about what was close to 15% or so against, or 16% against the yen and, and uh, something like 13 or 14 against the mark, if I remember. Uh, but then uh, that, that held for a while, but then there were a whole series of devaluations on an interim basis, like the British pound. And it wasn't really until, what, 1976 or so in Jamaica that um, the new system really evolved, the system evolved into something that looked like today. Can you speak a little bit about that, Jeffrey? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, I wanted to focus on the, the decisions that were made, but as I got into writing it, uh, researching it and writing it, I realized that th the execution of the decisions was as interesting as the decisions themselves. And um, there was an interim agreement uh, to fix exchange rates again with a dollar being devalued, as you said, Ken. Um, but it didn't hold very long because there was, so much <laughs> there was so much turbulence in the global economy that um, the US had to devalue yet again. And then other countries started to devalue. And so it became clear, it, it became clear within, within two, two years 
that it was impossible to fix the rates. But they never gave up officially until 1976, when the un, at a big international monetary international monetary fund meeting, they decided to change the IMF agreement that would allow so that it would allow countries to float. So it sort of became official. So I think it's fair to say that between 1971 and 1976, the entire global financial system um, was restructured, but it was very much weighted towards the weekend that I described in my book, and I would say the year of negotiations that followed it. Yeah, well, I think the weekend you describe is the one that inevitably sets off this, this train of events, which um, uh, unfolds over the next uh, decade or two and is really where we are today. Um, let's turn to the present for a few minutes, um, or, or actually, uh, uh, first, let's talk about the dollar and then perhaps uh, a bit uh, today. Why do you think the dollar was able to retain its preeminence during that period of time? Well, that's a great question because I think at the time, if anyone would have said, you delink the dollar from gold and the dollar will actually stay as strong as it had been. And that it was as, as, as use, uh, people would want to use it as much as they had before. Um, I don't think anybody would have believed it because there was, I think, a sense that it was the gold backing of the dollar which accounted for enormous amount of its value in the event that wasn't true. Um, I think what happened was, first of all, there was no country that was economically and politically as strong as the US or even close. So that was a big advantage. Um, secondly, there was enormous confidence in US institutions, in, the, in, in an independent Fed, and a strong SEC in the rule of law. Um, and I think it, it, it emerged that you could have floating currencies and that the dollar could be preeminent because of the kind of country that uh, was backing it. Um, and, I, and, and I think another thing was sort of what, what, what some people call the network effects. Everybody was so used to using the dollar that it became more difficult to abandon it than it did to, to hold on to it, even if you had some doubts. Um, and at no point in, in did, did Germany want to have a global currency or did Japan want to have a global currency? Because when you do, uh, you're, really, um, you're really saying to the rest of the world, um, you know, our currency is going to be managed in large part with international factors in mind. And no other country really, uh, really wanted to do that. I, I, um, England did it uh, in the 19th century, early 20th century, but no one, no other country really wanted to challenge the dollar. So I think that the dollar stayed strong um, for a multi multiplicity of reasons. Uh, and one of the real big questions, which I think we'll get to, is uh, do those factors still count, or do they count? So let's do they count? Do they count for as much? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, the Biden administration today and uh, the Nixon administration in 1971. In many respects, uh, both are in similar positions. Nixon uh, recognized that the um, power of the United States to kind of uh, uh, tell the world this is what we're going to do was diminishing the power of West Germany, Japan as an economic bloc or economic forces was rising. Today, we have the rise of China, and again, a challenge to the not so much primacy of the US, because obviously that changed in the 70s, but the balance of power is shifting economically. What do you think that the Biden administration can learn from the Nixon experience? And what do you think this means for, for the dollar as a reserve currency? That's a great question. Um, and I'm going to throw the question back at you, too, because you're also you're so involved in in global markets. But let me start with where you did that there are some similarities between the situation the US faced in 71 and, and today. Um, then we trade deficits were 
of growing concern. Uh, then there was a mood of, of nationalism and even isolationism because of uh, we were coming to the end of Vietnam and highly distasteful experience. And I think it's fair to say that there's enormous pressure on the US to look inward again. Um, you know, then we basically said, we can't hold up the world ourselves. We need more cooperation from the allies. And today, if you look at Biden, he is making an extraordinary effort to have allied cooperation. And I think he understands how, how crucial that is. The two big differences though are this, that in 1971, um, the US was just becoming deeply involved in the global economy. We weren't there yet. Nobody had even used the word globalization. And as far as most people in, the, in America were concerned then, we were big enough and strong enough to go it alone. Um, that is obviously not the case now. We're deeply in that. Our policies have to take into account globalization in a way, or global connections, global interconnections in a way that it, they didn't in 71. And then I think our political power uh, relative to other countries was much greater than it is today. Today, we can't do very much unilaterally and, and succeed or at least succeed uh, for a long time. So there are some similarities and there's some differences, but I do agree that there are some things the Biden administration could learn from what Nixon did. Uh, and I think that the time is somewhat appropriate because I believe we are coming to an end of an era. I, I don't know exactly when the end will be, but um, I think that the, the, uh, the advent of uh, a, a lot of challenges to the dollar, which are on the horizon, particularly with digital currencies and cryptocurrencies and the rise of China, um, really has to make us think, is it, is it wise to think we're going, the dollar's gonna play the same role that it is in our future as it's played in our past? Um, and then there's just China itself. Um, even in 1971, we faced competition from Japan and Germany, but they were, they were allies. Um, and today we face competition from China, which, which is of an order of magnitude that we have never, I don't think we've ever faced in our, you know, in our history. So what can, what can, given these similarities and differences, what can Biden learn from Nixon? Well, one is that Nixon really surrounded himself with some great people who had, um, but they were public spirited, but they also had very different viewpoints. And as I show in the book, he, he heard them all out. Um, he may have, he, he was very um, um, skillful in, in, in creating one policy out of the differences of views, but he at least knew what all the alternatives were were. So I think that um, as, as the Biden administration thinks about the future, and if, if they think in the terms that I am, that we are really, um, we're entering a, a much new era, um, having the right people and having people that can express a variety of viewpoints is really key. The second thing is that uh, while the big decisions were made over a weekend, uh, there was an enormous amount of analysis that preceded it. And um, Paul Volcker, for example, led uh, a study in the US uh, about the future of the financial system. It took almost three years to complete the study. Um, I, I saw all the drafts as I did my research and it really was incredibly impressive because they didn't try to predict what was gonna happen they just predicted the different ways the international economy could evolve and, and what the US interests were and what policies we could take and even anticipated how other countries might react and what we would do in that respect. And Peterson um, oversaw a study about the US and the world economy, which the heart of which was, was 
we have to make some really big changes. And among the changes he recommended, which, which unfortunately were not listened to at the time, I mean, he presented them, but they weren't listened to, was that we just can't blame other countries for our problems. That in the end, what happens in the US is the most important international economic policy you can have. And Peterson was advocating that we really look at how technology would develop and make a massive effort to invest in advanced technology. And he said, when we do this, the workforce is gonna to have to change and we need to make equal investments in the skills of the workforce or else we're gonna find ourselves with either a lot of, too many low, low wage jobs or too much unemployment. And these are, you know, many of these are the same issues that we're, we're, uh, we're dealing with today. So I, I would never say um, that history repeats itself, nor that the lessons of a previous era are exactly the lessons that we should learn today. But I, think, I think this, because of the, the magnitude of the issue I wrote about, and the and nature of the meeting. In other words, we, we can actually have visibility into how the, the certain decisions were made. I think it's a really good context to think about in as we think about the future. You know, not 100% not direct parallels, but uh, a lot of things to think about in order to get it right this time. So, Jerry, do you think that the um, floating currencies, the, the delinking of the dollar to gold and the floating of currencies led to globalization, of uh, led to a, uh, um, a much more, an exponential growth in the globalization of trade, or were there other factors that are driving that? Well, I'm sure there are other factors. I mean, you know, I don't, I never subscribe to a sort of one factor right. explanation, but um, I think floating exchange rates made globalization much more, um, much bigger and much more intense and, and that it, it moved goods and services and capital much faster. And one of the reasons, Ken, you, you, you touched on this was um, that it allowed us not to uh, have to manipulate domestic policies all the time that the exchange rate could take the, the you know, was like a, a shock absorber. And so we were able to import a lot more. We were able to, other countries were able to, um, uh, to export a lot more um, uh, because we had floating exchange rates. And if they had to worry about fixed rates, I think, and, and make domestic adjustments instead, my guess is we would have had a lot of protectionism because the system could only take so, take so much. And I, and I think we pushed it as, almost as far as we can. Uh, but as, as we said before, this wasn't an unalloyed good. Um, in fact, I think that we failed to deal with globalization in the way that, uh, that we should have. It, it, we, 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 ignored, we ignored the social factors, we ignored, um, the uh, the workforce globalization became something that benefited a very small slice of our country much more than the rest. I mean, I can make the case that everybody everybody benefited from low prices, but the real benefits went to the you know the the, the top ten percent. Um, and uh, we it wasn't globalization's fault. We, we didn't have the domestic policies that um, provided the cushion and the, and, and in many cases the I think redistribution through the tax system that would have made globalization much more sustainable from, uh, from a social standpoint. And, and, you know, I personally would say from a moral standpoint as well. Yeah, I would, I would echo that point. What struck me is that we had two um, very powerful forces operating almost uh, at the same time. You had the globalization, which was unleashed by uh, the, the floating exchange rate regimen, which I think you very astutely and accurately point out allowed for a much freer flow of goods and services and capital cross borders. And 
almost at the same time, you had this uh, uh, development of this idea of um, uh, shareholder capitalism, where you basically were favoring capital over labor and the maximization of value of the firm was really the, mode, the means to do that. And so you had this massive explosion in trade at the same time that capital was favored over labor because of the, um, uh, share, the, the, the primacy of shareholder capitalism. And I think that unleashed these forces, which um, resulted in the concentration of the benefits of trade in fewer hands. This was not the case in Germany, as an example, where I think that you see um, this massive increase in trade over the same period of time, but because of the way that society works, a more balanced split between uh, labor and capital during the period of time. So it's just a fascinating um, confluence of events all at once, which I think has a lot to do with where we are today. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. And, you know, um, there are a lot of ways to understand this story and, you know, there are theoretical ways. And, and yep. what I tried to do really was to tell it through the characters um, because it turned out that sitting around that table at Camp David were people who were extremely interesting and extremely knowledgeable and who in one way or another represented all the different ways of thinking uh, in 1971. And I didn't know this when I started the book, but um, 1971 was, was a key year. It was, you know, we were getting out of Vietnam uh, with all the political ramifications. It was the first time the US had been defeated, really defeated in a war. Um, we had our first trade deficit since the late 1800s. So we were beginning to face international competition. Um, we uh, had been this outward looking altruistic country and suddenly Nixon was battling real protectionist forces. The, the bills that Congress were almost passed in 1970 and 1971, it looked like the 1930s. I mean, we had a very protectionist Congress. And one of the reasons that Nixon wanted to make a big splash with a series of international and domestic policies was to show that the US was not just sitting back. And he was very successful in that respect because uh, we never we we didn't go protectionist, and uh, I I think that the floating exchange rates was a was a big reason for that, and you know if you just stop for a minute to think, the difference between the last several decades, what the difference would have been if we went isolationist and protectionist, it could have happened, it could have happened, and I think that this meeting was it was not the only thing, but it was a re at least very symbolic of crossroads and we took the right road. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. There's a question in the queue about um, uh, whether or not the UK uh, decision to delink pound from gold in 1931 was taken into account by this particular group during this particular weekend. Uh, I'm curious whether or not you ran across that in terms of uh, uh, the work you did, but also very importantly, what's clear is the UK in 1931, the pound was the reserve currency. That event led to the pound not being the reserve currency, if I recall. And the 1930s ended up very differently when it came to uh, trade policies very quickly after that, um, very different from what happened here, probably because there's immense leadership on the part of the US during this period of time. Well, this is a great question. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, in 1944, when the Bretton Woods system was established, the, the, the US and the UK were really the only two countries that were standing. So, you know, we talk about the allies, but these were the two countries that established the Bretton Woods system. And they had very much in mind what happened in the 30s. Um, and so they, uh, they, they attributed the instability of the gold standard to and they, they linked that to protectionism. And the way they did it was once you weren't linked to gold, you could manipulate your currency to get unfair advantage in trade. And that's in fact what happened. So in 1944, they said, well, we got to have some backing for currencies because you know you could go back thousands of years and it was very rare that a currency 
wasn't backed by some kind of metal. They just, they weren't ready to do that. Um, and so, and gold was traditionally the metal, but they thought if they linked it to the dollar and they linked it at a fixed rate and they looked at how much gold the US had, we, you know, we had, I think, well over half the world's gold, but we certainly had enormous gold coverage of the dollar, as I said before, 160%. It was inconceivable that we would go off the gold standard. They just didn't think that was going to happen. Um, but they had the UK thing in mind. Interestingly, there were a couple of uh, academics who said, this is great, but it's not going to last. Because if everybody, if the dollar is so strong, everybody's going to want it. And if everybody has dollars, there'll be more dollars than there will be gold. So the system um, contains the seeds of its own destruction, but it took it took 25 years for that to happen. Uh, turning again to the current times, Jeffrey, um, how do you, what do you think this um, uh, portends for um, uh, the rise of uh, China as a potential uh, competitor to the U.S. in terms of currency? What does it mean in terms of some of the digital currencies that are out there? How are you thinking about that? Or how do you think about that in the context of what we saw in 1971? Well, I'd be lying if I told you I really have a firm understanding, let alone a view of digital currencies and cryptocurrencies, but um, I would look at it this way. I think China is, well, of course, China is a major challenger when it comes to trade. That has not been the case in the financial arena because uh, China can't have an international currency until its domestic market is freed up. You can't, it can't be an international currency if you, if you can't move your money in and out of China. And they're not ready to do that. Um, however, um, they are using, they are um, in advanced stages of what's called a digital, uh, a central bank digital currency in which their central bank will be issuing digital currencies directly. And it's very possible that they will use this in a variety of countries where their trade relationships are particularly strong. I don't think anybody fully understands the significance of this, but what it says to me is we can't just look at conventionally how currencies have worked. Um, the rise of the digital world is very, in its very early stages. Um, and China is hell bent to take advantage of that. So I, for one, would just say we have to be extremely vigilant. And, and at all costs, we can't be arrogant and say nobody is going to use the digital China currency outside of China. Um, you know, we, we, we're very slow. I mean, compared to China, we're we're very um, we're behind the curve when it comes to the use of the of, of digital currencies. When it comes to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, um, this is the way I look at it. You know, currencies, as we said before, is a matter of how much you trust the government. And um, I think trust in our government is is pretty low. Um, and I think that the new generation or the younger generations are really anxious to find some kind of system in which that does not rely on government policy. And uh, blockchain, which is the underlying system that Bitcoin uses, I think is something to, to really watch because it's going to go very deep into the culture of a couple of generations that basically find the uh, commitments of the U.S. government to be uh, less than credible. So I guess what I'm saying is I think, I think that the dollar, uh, the, the continuation of the centrality of the dollar is not going to go away in the next five years or so, but I think we have to be really careful to watch the, the digital and crypto world because I think there's, some, there's something there, even if we don't fully understand it. 
So let's go back to the characters because a big part of the book is um, really describing the, the, the individuals involved. Who do you think comes out the best? Um, who, do, who are you most fascinated by? Uh, give me your sort of takeaway looking back now, 50, 60, I guess really 50 years on from this as to how, how to kind of handicap this group. Yeah, it's 50 years because the meeting was August 13th to 1571. So in a couple of weeks, we hit the 50th anniversary. Um, actually, I was, I was fascinated by all the characters. Um, I was fascinated by the tension between Kissinger, the global strategist, and Connolly, the economic nationalist. And I was fascinated by the fact that these two men really understood where the other was coming from, didn't buy the position, but realized that in the end, they had to find some common ground. And I describe exactly how they did that. And I think, uh, I think it, you know, to me, this was one of the most interesting parts of the whole, of the whole saga. Um, I, I was fascinated by Paul Volcker because the level of knowledge that he had about the global financial system um, and the, uh, I said, you know, he really believed that a government had to, uh, that the word of a government had to be trusted. And, and he, he I, you know, of all the people, and I asked the question, in values that I can really understand, I would say, Paul Volcker, and he was, you know, he was, uh, I think he was in the early 40s at the time. Uh, uh, Peterson, it wasn't Peterson's character so much, but his foresight that he could look ahead and say, we have to invest in ourselves. We can't blame so many of our problems on other countries. Um, and it, it, incidentally, that's, I think, uh, this has been a, a philosophical strain in the US that continues to today. But we wanna blame everything on China. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not apologizing for China, but I'm just saying there's so much that we can do domestically that would give us enormous strength. And I think Peterson was, uh, you know, was foreshadowing that. And then the, you know, the, the um, Nixon himself, when I, when I started to write this book, my view of Nixon was 99% colored by Watergate. But I tried to do, write the book in such a way that I examined what was happening at the time. And then 69 and 70 and 71, Nixon did a lot of things that were quite impressive. I don't care for him as a person. I never, I'm never going to say he had the right values. But he had an enormous amount of public policy experience. And he understood how, and, and he, he had, I think, a great grasp of the global situation. And through the events that I talk about, uh, we certainly could have done an awful lot worse in terms of the kind of president uh, we have. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to rehabilitate Nixon for all times, but I, I think I uh, dealt with a with a angle, uh, set of characteristics that that are worth recalling. Jeffrey, I think we're just about to run out of time, and I just want to say how thoroughly enjoyable this book was to read. I highly recommend it. I think everyone from this conversation probably has a, a certainly a greater appreciation for it. And um, I guess my last question is, what's next? <laughs> well, um, you know, I'm having a hard time thinking about what's next until, the, until August pass. Because I really wrote about something, the 50th anniversary, and it's still a couple of weeks away. But I think once it's over, I'll give some thought to another project. Thank you. And thank everyone for participating tonight. Thank you, Ken.